During Mother's Day, we encourage mothers to press to the mark of that high calling in Christ Jesus. If motherhood is a high calling, and it is, how much higher is a father's call? While a mother is God's caretaker of life, the father is the giver of that life. In this respect, the father is the cornerstone of the family, and without him, the family crumbles. We have looked over the years at many statistics, but we don't have to look at the statistics. We can look at the evidence that uh, homes without fathers are creating a, quite a problem in our nation. It uh, accounts for a lot of the crime that's going on. We've said that, well, the, the problem is because mothers are leaving the home. I don't think that's the root cause at all. I think it's fathers. and uh, I've gathered some statistics as a basis for encouragement that might help us see that uh, absentee fathers uh, is the root cause of the destruction of the family and not the departure of mothers. In fact, I think fathers have driven off mothers to go out and fend as best they can because their head has not assumed the responsibility. Let me share what I call the proof is in the pudding concerning this fatherless disease that has plagued our country, but it is a preventable disease. Fatherless children are four times more likely to be poor. 44% of children in mother-only families are poor. That's the U.S. Census Bureau report 2011. Fatherless children are at a dramatically greater risk of drug and alcohol abuse. Department of Human Health and Human Services. The children of single parent homes are more than twice as likely to commit suicide. They're emotionally disrupted. The, these are not just statistics. These are realities. These are things that are going on in our communities every day. Adolescents and father absence, absent since homes are more likely to report being sexually active compared to adolescents living with their fathers. 85% of all children that exhibit behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes, Center for Disease Control. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. Look at that. 70% of juveniles in state-operated institutions come from fatherless homes. What can the federal government do to decrease crime and revitalization is that source. Boys are more likely to have trouble establishing gender identity without a father in their home. And today we're experiencing a plague of gender identity crisis, if you will, where, where, where young men and, and, and women are, are not, they, do, they don't understand, and they're attributing that Somewhat, you ain't not, won't hear this on the news, but these are real governmental statistics. They're not going to put it on the news for you. That is, is creating this epidemic of 
of transgender and all this other stuff that's going on. There's a high degree of displaced anger. Uh, boy, that was one that hit me at home. Because I, I grew up in a, in a fatherless home. And I was one angry, one angry Jose. Uh, you know what's so scary about that? You're angry and you don't know why you're angry. You have no idea why you've got such rage inside of you. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God that he corralled that rage in this man. But I understand that. A high degree of displaced anger. You're just mad at everybody and don't know why. Bill Glass has counseled for some 25 years men who have been incarcerated said that among the thousands of prisoners he had met, not one of them genuinely loved his dad. 95% of those on death row stated, I actually hate my dad. I don't mean to bore you with this, but let me tell you, fathers are important. And we've lost sight of that reality. Amen? But in the church, it can be turned around. It can be turned around if we can get young men to understand what their role uh, in creation is above everything else. James Dotson passes on this story. Some years ago, executives of a greeting card company decided to do something special for Mother's Day. I think I shared this with you before. They set up a table in the federal prison inviting any inmate who so desired to send a free card to his mom. The lines were so long they had to make another trip to the factory to get more cards. Due to the success of the event, they decided to do the same thing on Father's Day, but this time no one came. Not one prisoner felt the need to send a card to his dad. Many had no idea who their fathers even were. That's sad. And we, and we dump all of this on women leaving the house. Oh no, friends. Oh no, don't put that at that door. <laughs> I'm not sure where we'd be without them. I got to tell you that right now. Because sometimes even the worst, the worst mother is still trying to hang on to her child. Amen. Father somewhere un unknown. According to the Federal Bureau of, of Prisons uh, report, May 27, 2017, 93% of prisoners are male. <laughs> When I read that, I said, this, it, it, there, there's simply no doubt that what, what Barbara Jackson said, about, uh, said back in, in 1998 still applies today. It is far easier to build strong children than to repair broken ones. We only got one shot at this thing. That's all we got. And because, you know, we've kind of lost vision of, of who we are. Why we do what we do. These statistics are not just st statistics. They're the realities we're faced with today. And they tell us if we got a father, we sure ought to appreciate him. Because there's a whole lot out there that don't have him. Amen. If fathers would simply be fathers. Now this is the clincher. If fathers would simply be fathers, it would decrease the crime rate 85%. Think about that. 85% of the folks that are in jail today would not be there if they had a father. If there was a father in the home. All of this makes father much more than just the breadwinner for the family. He is the stability 
of the family. He's the rock. He's the security for the family. Nothing can replace a father. Not two mothers. Amen? Nothing can replace a father in a child's heart. There's something about a father that a mother can't supply. And there's something about a mother that a father can't supply. And in God's wisdom, he gave children parents. He gave them parents. Because it takes two to tangle with them young little muskrats. Amen. One can't handle it. <laughs> Amen. It takes two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they're sitting up there saying, now, Papa, hold on. <laughs> like I say, I don't want to be bore you with statistics, but I want to provide a basis for the importance of fatherhood. And how fatherhood is so neglected. And that neglect is showing up in real term, real time in our young people. That's why they're so angry. That's why they're so disillusioned. They don't have that father. I'm going to walk through a little bit this morning. Some of those responsibilities of a father and I looked over some of the messages I've done in the past and kind of combined some of those for today to highlight some of the things that will encourage fathers today, amen, and will encourage young men. I think fathers ought to teach their young sons to be fathers above everything else. Teach, that's what God brought him into this world for. Amen? Not to gobble up the riches of this world. That's easy to do. That's, that, that's, not, that's not hard to do. Amen? But bringing up a child in the way he should go. Well, what's the way he should go? Well, if it's a male, he ought to be a, he, he's a father first. Amen? He's a father first. Because God created in that way. The first thing that we need to remember is that God is Father. Father is not something that came from, from man. It didn't originate out of the fact that man declared himself to be Father. We are commanded to address God as our Father. God is eternal. God has no beginning. God has no end. God says, call me Father, because I was Father to Jesus before the whole world was created. Amen? Jesus says, restore me to the glory that I had before the creation of the world. God was Father way back then. Amen? And we know that God is uh, then eternal. Therefore, Father doesn't have this human uh, uh, origin. Amen? God the Father gave life, now watch this, gave life to Adam. He gave life to Adam. In other words, God breathed into Adam and Adam became a living soul. When he did that, he also gave Adam the power of life. Now, I want, I want to explain that. Amen. I'm not talking about creative power of God, but he gave Adam something that he did not give Eve. He gave Adam the power of life. Ad Eve came out of Adam. She got her life from Adam. Amen? After Eve, all life would come through Eve. Amen? But Adam has the life in him. He must impart that life to the, the woman in order for her to carry his child. That's something that's lost today. That's what, that makes a father. A father is, I am giving to the mother that 
child and that she's going to carry that child. That life has gone from me to her and produced a child. A woman can't produce a child by herself because there's no life. And that is evidenced over time. And just, just the way God created women. But Adam now, he gives that life. He is the father. In that, in that, it makes him like God. Not God. But as God gave life to Adam, he gave Adam the gift to give life. The Father only, God, can give life. Amen? And he gave that to the man in his creation. And that makes man father. As he demonstrates that he is the image and he is the glory of God. God has all dominion over everything. And Adam had dominion before the woman. Amen? And it was together as a helpmeet he brought her uh, to, to Adam. And God said that the woman will then be the glory of the man. She will reflect the man. Adam, who came directly from the hand of God in terms of creation, uh, because there was nothing there before Adam. There was no human being before Adam. So that's what I mean by direct, is that he was created out of nothing. The woman was created out of man. And, you know, I always say that's why women are a little soft. They, God had some better material to, to work with. Amen. Not better and superior. But he took men out of the dirt. <laughs> How many times have I said that's why if you look at a man and you rub his elbows, they, they kind of hard. <laughs> Them knees, they kind of, you know what I mean? <laughs> They, 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 they're kind of hard because he likes dirt. You, you find a bunch of boys out there playing, they, they like to eat dirt. Go that where they come from. <laughs> now you take a little girl and she's repulsed by that dirt. She don't want nothing to do with that dirt. She came out of the flesh of the man. Soft tissue. Soft tissue. Everything about her is soft. Not just the physical thing, but her whole demeanor is that way. So that she can carry life and bring into that child the softness of God. The kindness, the compassion of God. She can bring into that child. And so Adam is the glory, he's the image and the glory of God. While Eve is the image of and of God, but the glory of man. Amen? And I think we've got this thing kind of turned upside down uh, today. We've really got it turned up that side down. The father then actually sets the tone for the home. He, he sets the tone. Uh, now, now the woman... Has a, a great influence. I think somebody's at the door if somebody wants to get that. Uh, the, 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 the father sets the tone for, for the family. And if we look at Proverbs, it says, My son, hear the instructions of your father. The father is responsible for teaching the difference between what is right and wrong in a home. How many homes is that left up to the mother? How many homes is that done? That's not the way it was created to be. Amen. It is not to say that the, she does not have a role in that. But it's that man that ought to be establishing that. He sets that, that thing just like God establishes what's right and wrong. Are you with me? Because the man is an image a reflection of who God is. And that man then is going to demonstrate to the children 
who God is. They will learn who the Father, our Father is. How? Through the Father. When the Father ain't there, they got no reference point. Because the mother can never be a father. Because she was not created for that purpose. It does not mean she cannot instill spiritual things into the child because we know Lois and, and, and did that with her grandmother Eunice Slade in, uh, in uh, Timothy. <laughs> uh, I mean, not Eunice Slade. <laughs> a father teaches a child not to run with sinners. You know, children, we say, well, you know, I don't want to pick my children's friends. You know, we ought to pick something. Some of them, we ought not allow our children to mess with them. Amen? See, they get messed up as a child. Whew! You try to get it out of them later on. Now, it might get out. They may get it out of them, but they may get hurt in the process. Amen? So we got to teach them, don't run with sinners. Don't be, don't be influenced with, with sinners. And, of course, the, the big question always comes up, well, how are we going to save them if we're not with them? Well, <laughs> If we're in the sandbox talking about Jesus, then oh, glory be to God. But you listen to some of that sandbox conversation, and I'll tell you what, you put triple X on it. Some of the things that come out of these young children's mouths, one, first, second, third grade, will shock you. Will shock you. Amen? See, the father has to be there to instruct the child of the wrongness of that. That's not normal language. That's, that's not good talk. Stay away from those who like to do evil things. Because their path will run to death. If we care about them as fathers, we're going to do what our father does. When he sees us going the wrong way, he doesn't step back and say, well, I just let him make his own choices. Aren't you glad for that? God will do everything he can to keep us out of trouble if we let him. Now, some of us break through even God's hand and he has to he has to honor our decisions. But he does everything he can to prevent us from going down a road of misery. So we ought to watch what kind of friends our young people hang around with. Sometimes we have to watch the adults that they hang around with. Amen. Another thing we should remember is the father is the chief discipliner. And I've, I've spoken to that just a moment ago. He, the father that spares his rod, hates his son. But he that loves his Loves him, chastens him betimes. That means often. We, we typically look at that as, as a whooping that he gives them. But it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Chastisement can simply be correcting an error in a child. And the more that child knows that, that he is loved or she is loved by that father the easier it is to correct that child when they're wrong. Because they value that love relationship more than anything else. You see, this is, this is how we relate to God, isn't it? If we love Him, we don't want to hurt Him. And it's that love that keeps us from sinning against Him and causes us to understand that when He's telling us no, it is to our benefit. As earthly fathers, we play that role with our own children. Isn't that amazing? The father who does not discipline his child then is more concerned about himself than his own child. That's why he doesn't discipline the child. All he wants is his children to like him. See, that's about him. It's not about the child. <laughs> Amen? E even, if, even if that means losing that child's soul, it, I just want the kid to like me. Amen? I can understand all of this. Amen? I'm just throwing it out there because without fathers, the home's in disarray. Yeah. 
the home's in disarray. Fathers are not loving their children when they allow their children to have their own way all the time. Well, I don't want to shackle my kid down. I don't, I don't, just let them find their own way. There's only one way they can find. There's only one way that they will find. It'll be a wrong way. You know why? Because we're all subject to sin. And this, as I said to our class this morning in Sunday school, we don't have to do anything whatsoever to sin. We have to do something to do right. But to sin, <laughs> we come in this world sinful. We come in this world with a sin nature. If that sin nature is left alone, that child does not have a foundation to do anything but what the sin nature tells him or her to do. We cannot allow them then to simply have their own way. There are some things we allow them to have their own way in, but we just don't step back and say, I'm not going to influence that in some areas. Because God doesn't do that with us. Walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill the, the lust of the flesh. Amen. Because the spirit lusts against the flesh. The flesh against the spirit. These two are contrary. So that you cannot do what you will. What do we want to do? We want to sin. <laughs> so if we walk in the spirit. Then we don't do those things. Are you with me today? And the father is the, is the one who is responsible for that. Children not only need chastisement, but they want it. Children want somebody to care for them. Now, they ain't saying that when you're beating them. But one day... They're going to come back and appreciate that little discipline. As they look back over their lives and see what they could have gotten into, but didn't because they had a father who said no. Who said no. Amen? You got, you got to pass that on. They come into the world, these children, rebellious and self-centered. On their way to a devil's hell, somebody has got to be there to bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the Father. That's the Father. Chasten thy son, says uh, Proverbs 19, 18, while there is hope. And let not thy soul spare for his crying. If chastisement is lacking, the heart will become so hardened that it no longer receives correction. He says, do it while there's yet hope. Amen? You have to do it while there's hope. You know, Deuteronomy talks about a, a, a child that is, that is rebellious. He's a gluttonous. So we know uh, he's, a, he's rebellious, he's a gluttonous, he's a drunkard. So we know this child is not six years old or seven years old or ten years old. It's a grown man that his parents have tried to correct over and over and over again and he will not be corrected. That's serious. So then what, is he, what do they tell the parents to do? They say, you take that child. This is a grown man. And you bring him before the elders and you say to them, this our son is rebellious. He's a glutton and a drunkard. And he will not submit to correction. They said, let, give him to the priest and the whole community have to come out and stone him to death. That's serious business, ain't it? Now that's not what we're supposed to do today. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. I'm only suggesting the seriousness of chastisement and the need for that before that child gets to a point where, chest, where correction is no longer possible. Amen? And it also tells us sometimes, 
You, you get one of those roots that just grow up rebellious. No matter how much you try to correct them. No matter how much you try to correct them. I'm always telling parents, there's a point now, even if you did everything wrong, there's a point where that child's responsible for himself or herself. And those parents don't do everything wrong, though. That's what breaks their heart. They've done it right. And they still twist off. Well, that's their choice then. That's their choice. That's not a problem all, always with the parent. But where there's a lack of that father figure, now that's a different story. Because now the child don't stand a chance, does he? Another thing that the father's responsible for is to teach them to respect their mother. Boy, don't we need that today. Proverbs 1 and 8 also says that forsake not the law of your mother. Listen to your father and forsake not the law of, of your mother. A father should never stand by and allow his child to disrespect his mother. That ought not happen. You know why? You see... <laughs> A child that disrespects the mother will soon disrespect the father. I'll guarantee you that. Sooner or later, that's going to happen. Amen? The talking back and the, the talking over, the ignoring what they say, acting like I don't hear. There's a cure for that, dads. <laughs> There's a real cure for that. You, you did not hear me, did you? Okay, you said that like you didn't hear me, huh? Well, hear this. <laughs> I meant to hear you then. <laughs> A father who disrespects his wife teaches his child to disrespect his mother. Isn't that something? And that's why you see little boys disrespecting little girls that's why you hear about some of the seem like impossible things going on in grade school with kids with kids the father is saying to the child when he doesn't respect the mother you don't have to do what she says When you tell that child, you'd better do what your mother tells you to do. Now, that's being a father. Amen. See, God the Father said, you better listen to my son and you do what he tells you to do. This is all spiritual, friends. This is just not something we concocted in the brain. This is, you know, this is illustrating that relationship we have with God. The father is illustrating that. He has not given that responsibility to the mother. He's given that responsibility to the husband. And it's a heavy responsibility. Too many men will say, well, I just don't know how to do it. Well, let me tell you, you were created to do it. It is not something you have to kind of learn. You were created to do this. Now get into the word of God and find out what God says he created you to do. That's all we have to do. I'm, amen. Instead of sitting back talking about, I just don't know how to do it. Some of us, self-included, you know, we grew up without father, so we didn't know how to do it. Folks will say to me sometimes, well, you, you seem to have done it all right. And I'm quick to tell them, no, I did not. I've said it to every one of my children. You know, we didn't got saved. But don't care. Just because we did the best we could doesn't mean it was the best. Amen. Sometimes parents got to get real with themselves, don't they? Huh? It might, it might have been the best you could do, but it wasn't the best. The best would have been to get into that word. The best would have been, you know, get saved when you're two years old. <laughs> Uh, 
If fathers have a responsibility to the family, to the wife, and to the children, then specifically, Father's Day ought to be have something to do with children. Amen? And so Proverbs 4 and 1 says, Hear, you children, the instructions of your father. If your father's telling you to do something, listen to him. Don't back talk your dad. Amen? Don't back talk your dad. And dad, don't let him back talk you. <laughs> don't let him back talk you. You not going to ruin them. You know, just the scripture before, he said, now, if you go ahead and chastise them, he says, don't, don't stop because they get to crying. That means that, that he putting, them on, putting it on them pretty hard if they crying. That, that's more than just go stand in the corner. <laughs> Amen. That's just a little bit more than time out. <laughs> I mean, he's doing something to cause some tears to come. He says, now look at here. Uh, just because they cry, don't you stop that. You let them know. What's the, what's the point in that? It is to let them know there is a consequence. It is a painful consequence for disobedience. A painful consequence. It's not a time out. God doesn't say to us, you know, when you die, he said, okay, I'm going to give you some time out. You've been sinning, but I just give you some time out to get yourself together. All time out does is, you know, them, you know put them in the wall like that. They come out with a head like that. You, you got you gotta, you gotta to you gotta, you gotta touch them a little bit. You got to touch them somewhere that it, it hurts them. Amen. It, it may, you know, today all you have to do is take their, their cell phone away from them. You've just, just done some real damage. <laughs> you might as well shoot a child if you take away his, his iPad or his, his, his cell phone. Isn't that true? You know? So there's some things we can do and stay out of jail today. <laughs> so I, I don't want to preach us in, into jail. <laughs> but children, you ought to be listening. Because today's Father's Day, and the way you show a father appreciation is you do what he tells you to do. You know why? Because Jesus said, I do everything my father tell me to do. See how that, that father, heavenly father, earthly father, God aligned that thing up so that that family would get to understand our father? Can't do it but through the Father. Can't do it but through the Father. You know, as much as old Lois and, and Eunice worked with little old Timothy, Timothy was strong in the faith, but Timothy was timid. He didn't have that strong spiritual father figure, though he had a father there who didn't take charge of the spiritual things in life. And Timothy grew up in faith, but he was timid. And Paul had to jump in there and kind of form that, that kind of strength in him. Because Timothy was timid. He didn't want to confront things the way he ought to confront them. Amen? Now, children... You're responsible for listening to your parents. If you want to know what God called you to do, that's what he called you to do. He called you to listen to your parents. Children, do you hear me today? All you children say, yeah, if you hear me. Boy, that's weak. <laughs> Somebody's in trouble when y'all get home because they, they ain't listening to this, brother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Children, uh, uh, are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm going to leave that alone. It's not going to get much better. <laughs> Children are commanded to obey your parents. That's your whole job. That's living for Christ. You ought to be thankful that you've got somebody that's going to help steer your life in a way of righteousness. Keep you out of trouble. Help you in school. You know, keep you in church. Not just as a ritual, but for, for show sure enough, man, this means something to me. Amen. So that when you grow up, you can look back and see, look at all the things I missed. All the misery I've missed. All the pain I've missed. And you start to appreciate 
that chastisement. You get to appreciate and see how, as God says, you know, I don't like this. I, I, it's not in me to do what I'm doing to you, but I've got to do it in order to correct you. You see that that father loved you. He hated what he had to do, but he loved you more than let you go. Children, it's important to you. If you got a dad, so many don't have dads. So many don't have, whatever the reason be, they're not there. And the results, why those are the, the statistics I mentioned earlier. Teach them the wisdom of the Lord. Fathers, make that a priority above all else. Find a way in everything to reflect a spiritual lesson in that very thing. Find a way to do it. You see, if that's where my heart's at, I'm going to find a way to do it. Teach them to depart from their evil. Teach them to, to not tolerate evil in any kind of way, inside or outside the home. Sometimes there's some, some things they don't need to be watching on television. We should never let them, a little child alone with a remote. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Nor with a computer. <laughs> uh, we ought to have direct access to those things. Why? Because we're concerned. Children are innocent. Sinners, yes, but innocent. They don't know but what we teach them. Dads, fathers, that's all they know. And they're learning stuff every day from all kinds of sources. If we aren't there as, the, as that stable source of truth, they will not know how to decide when they're not with us. When we're not there watching. They will not know how to make those vital decisions that need to be made at that point as they're growing up. Fathers, grandfathers, great-great-grandfathers. We ain't got any great ones in here. Amen. Not great in terms of value, just in terms of age. <laughs> Mother, whoa. Teach them the fear of the Lord. You can't teach what you ain't got. When you got the fear of the Lord, nobody's going to tell you to teach your child. They will see it. They will see it in everything you do. They will see that fear of the Lord. You know, in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, it speaks about a husband or, or just a spouse, we'll say, could be a husband or a wife, who's married to someone who is a, uh, an unbeliever. And they tell the believer to win them without a word. A lot of child re rearing and teaching the fear of God is teaching them without a word. You can tell them uh, the, the fear of God and they won't know what that's about. But when they see that we're scared to do certain things, they can start to see the fear of God in our life. When they can see that we, we, more, I can't do that. No, I can't watch that. They begin to see. That. We don't have to keep pounding them with, see, because I, this is the fear of the Lord. This is the fear of the Lord. This is the fear. No, that ain't going to get it. That's not going to get it. That's doctrine. Kids don't understand doctrine. They, they understand what they see. I believe that a lot of kids are twisting off from church, not because there's bad doctrine, but because that's all there is. Kids got to see that this thing is real. And they see that through the father. I'm not excluding the mother. You had your turn earlier. I'm not excluding them. I'm just showing that the significance of the father. Without him, 
that family will crumble. Some have been able to overcome. Many have not been able to overcome. And even those who overcome will sit down and weep. Strong men, good men of God, they will weep wishing they had had that father. It leaves a cavern that cannot be filled. Amen? It really does. We need to teach these children the fear of the Lord. What does that mean? Just common respect. Common respect. Boy, you know, I don't want to go old time on us like, man, here's how things used to be. I mean, I'm not just going there, but I can remember just as a child at the grocery store, you would open the door for a lady. A child would do that. Just common respect. <laughs> Shoot, you open the door, they'd knock you down getting, getting past you now. See, they're not learning that respect at home. That's where, that res that's where respect is, 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 is learned. Respect and trust then kind of go together, don't they? Love and respect go together. Where there's love, there will always be respect. Where there's love and respect, there will always be trust. I now can trust what dad is saying because I respect him and I respect him because I see how he respects my mom. Boy, everything we need. See, in them old days, they were living in tents. They won't live in these kind of communities we got right now. Amen. And so family was very important. Family kind of lived together. They did everything together. And, 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 and we call it that patriarchal archaeal age, and, 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 and we, we want to get away from that today. Uh, I, I'm not so sure we should be trying to get away from it. Amen? We ought, we ought to get back to something like that. Now, let's not go back to the sinful part of that, but go back to the righteous part of that. Where that, that father's taking care of the family and giving the family reason to respect him reason to show honor to him reasons see god says that in your sunday school lessons he says you know what when they got to kadesh uh, bernier after the the israelites uh, had um, had uh, gotten out of uh, egypt they got there and they didn't want to go in you know what i'm saying they wouldn't go in and uh <laughs> God says the reason you won't go in because you, you despise me. They had no respect for him. And then God says this. He says, after all I've done for you. And I told the class, I said, God's not trying to buy our love. That ain't what he's doing. He's not trying to force us to love him. He's not doing that either. He's loving us because he loves us. He, loved, he, he wants us to turn to him. Why? Because it's best for us. I mean, listen to Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at what happened in the days of Noah. God could just wipe it all out and start all over. He doesn't have to fool with us. He has chosen to love us. Huh. Isn't that something? And here's the children of Israel. They, they disrespect him. They have no respect for his promises. They have no respect for him. We've got to teach them that respect. Our children. We've got to remind them of what God has done for us. Not beat them over the head with it, but remind them. You know, God's, here's what God has done in our life. At the earliest age, this is how we got through. God was walking with us. There's a time we got we to gotta bring God into the discussion of, of family life. There's a time that we need to show forth the word of God. In other words, let's win them without a word. And wisdom tells us the difference. 
the difference. Children need spiritual leadership like nothing else in the world. Spiritual leadership is, is lacking in too many Christian homes. What we do here, we say is a, we're a family, and indeed we are. But at home is where all of this is played out. At home is where all of this makes a difference. And kids are twisting off because they're not seeing a difference at home. They're hearing something, but that truth, they're not seeing that truth, and so church becomes boring. Church becomes not part of their, their life. We got to make it part of their life at the earliest stages. And that is done by how we uh, handle the Word of God at home. How they see that's serious with us. And if they don't see it serious with us, we can talk doctrine to them all, all day long. Here's what you ought to do because God doesn't like that. And we can just pile all that doctrine on. You know what we're doing? We're doing just what the Pharisees did. Pile all that doctrine on and wouldn't lift a finger to help them out with it. Wouldn't li lift a finger to help them to apply that. They just don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do. Do, 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 but wouldn't lift a finger. And when we just throw doctrine at them, that's what we're doing. God doesn't throw doctrine at us. You know what he throws at us? Love. That's what he throws at us, love. He throws mercy and compassion at us. And even in his chastisement, he's restrained and limited. And, he's, and all through it, he's letting us know how much he loves us. Hey, are you with me today? They need to understand that when God says something, God means it. That means we ought to train our children that all I got to do is say no once. I, I can't be telling you no ten times before you accept no or before you even consider, well, maybe. <laughs> Hello? That, that sounds strange to us, doesn't it? I can tell because I ain't gotten an amen from this from the time I started. <laughs> I mean, I, hey, I'm not stupid. <laughs> it's strange to us. But you know, it's not something that's harsh. It's something that if this is real to us, then it ought to be real at home. It ought to be. If, it, if this is just coming and going, then, then that's a different story. Then none of it's real. And so they will grow up understanding this is an obligation that we do. We do this. They've got to understand, especially in this world, where they're spending more time away from us than they are with us, they need a foundation. They need a foundation. They need something that when they're not with us, something alerts in them, whether they, they, they understand it or not, that says, that's something I better leave alone. That's something I better come home and ask dad about. Ask mom about. All of this makes father much more, as I said in the beginning, than just a breadwinner. Too many of us, self-included, thought that being a father meant that all you had to do is you go out and you get a job and you put the food on the table and you come home and, and, and you know, everything's okay and then you go out the next day. And, and that was all that father, a father was. Boy, a father's so much more than that. That's just a very, very small part. That's what he ought to do anyhow. It's his, it's his, it's his kid. Now think about that. See, that life came out of him. That's his. Too many have walked away from that responsibility. What have I tried to do today, really, on a Father's Day? Really just to remind us. To remind us. Some of us, our children maybe, you know, they're, they're out of the house. But if we're a father, we can help others. We, we can be that father to the fatherless. We really can. 
we can, we can help them along in love. We can't replace the Father. But boy, we can sure give them a, a better chance at life by sharing with them maybe that which we were not able to share with our own. For whatever the reason is, you know, we just out of ignorance or, you know, got saved late. Who, who knows what, why? But it's not too late for any of us. Grandparents, you know, grandfathers, we, you know, we, we got a special role. We got a real special role. But all of us, all of us should, should just step up to the plate. Step up to the plate and be what God has created us to be. More than a provider, a father. Stand with us. <laughs> If you, if you can, if your dad is not here uh, in the city, if he's still alive, make sure you do something to acknowledge him today. Just let him know that you love him. He might have not done everything right, but your life came from him. And you owe him that much. Amen. And besides, some of us messed our own lives up. It won't, Dad. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you. And Lord, we only hope that your word will take kind of root in our hearts. And for all of us, Lord, and the roles that you've given us in this life, we might present an image, Father, to our young children. After all, isn't that what it's all about? Teaching them to love you as we love you. Help us in this venture, Lord, today. We pray in Jesus' name. And all who believe said, Amen. And Amen.